Hello and salam. Welcome to the Muslim Viewpoint powered by American Muslim Today, the non-profit national digital newspaper that's transforming the narrative about Muslims in Western countries through public service and community journalism. I'm Rifat Malik, I'm AMT's Editor-in-Chief. And as we are just days away from critically important midterm elections, we have interviews with two trailblazing Muslim women of color who are making political headway on both sides of the coast, fighting in the name of education, conservation, and innovation, these women are doing their part to make their voices heard and to make politics more representative. Let's start with Ghazala Hashmi, who is Virginia's first Muslim and first South Asian senator. As she stands for re-election, she tells us how working in higher education influenced her decision to run for office, the significant role education plays in a person's life, and the ch changes she hopes to make by combating anti-Muslim rhetoric. So, um, Ghazala Hashmi, um, thank you for, for joining us today. Um, so you have already been elected um, in, in your state. Can you just tell us uh, a little bit about why you felt it was important to run for office and what kind of obstacles or uh, pushback did you face in your campaign? Thank you, and it's wonderful to, to join you today. Um, uh, so my rationale or impetus to run really came from two different sources. And one of those sources was the fact that I'd been working in higher education in Virginia for uh, uh, close to 30 years. And for the last 20 years, I'd spent uh, that time in the community college system in Virginia. And it was uh, working with students and seeing the ways in which government and policies in higher education were impacting their lives, making it challenging for them to finish their degree programs and to actually uh, succeed in the ways that we want people to succeed. I knew that we could do things better. Uh, the state government had been increasing tuition costs in Virginia. Uh, the cost of uh, textbooks has been rising significantly. And so a lot of my students face those challenges, but it wasn't um, just higher education policy that was affecting them. Uh, I had students who would become homeless in the middle of a semester or they faced food insecurity. And when there's such a host of social problems around their lives, uh, they are not able to focus focus on their academic work. And so one of the uh, reasons that compelled me to run for political office rather than just move in higher education policy issues uh, was the fact that I wanted to be at the table <laughs> and make decisions that would help uh, the folks that I was working with uh, make their lives a little bit easier, make their futures a little bit more possible. So that was one reason for me to, to run. And a second reason was, frankly, um, the election of Donald Trump. So when he was elected in 2016, he came in on a wave of uh, anti-Muslim rhetoric, anti-immigrant rhetoric, and uh, just uh, promoted the division and bigotry that uh, has uh, been a part of this country. And he supported that language. And um, that was deeply concerning to me. I'd lived in this country for close to 50 years at that point. I saw myself fully as an American. I taught American literature. I taught the values of uh, the, the development of American philosophy and democracy. And I knew that everything that Trump was saying was antithetical to the, the kind of country that uh, has been established and, and the direction we wanted to move in. Uh, so my first uh, uh, reaction was just to organize academic conferences around what it means to be Muslim in America. But I saw such a, an outpouring of engagement from folks in the community, people who wanted to learn more and be a part of this conversation. And so that led me to be more politically engaged. And so by 2018, I was ready to, to actually run for office myself. Um, so as a first time political candidate and as someone who came out of a non-political background, it was a big step for me, but uh, it, it just felt right. And, and I knew I had to speak up and I had to represent the, the people and uh, the, the issues that I care about. And, and during your campaign, did you, uh, I mean, you lived in your community, I imagine, for, for many years. 
Did you see a side of the community perhaps inspired by the national rhetoric that, that you just mentioned? Did you see a side of the community that you hadn't seen before in terms of you know how your faith was perceived? Did it become an issue in the in your campaign and during your election? You know, it actually did not. Um, when I first started running, I wasn't running as a Muslim candidate. I was running as an educator, as a mom who had lived in the community for 30 years, uh, as a Girl Scout troop leader <laughs> in all of the ways in which uh, my family had been engaged and involved in the community. And that was my focus. Uh, it did, be my religion and my faith did become an issue for the media uh, once they realized that I was uh, a Muslim and an immigrant and that there would be history to be made if I was elected as uh, the first Muslim to serve in the Virginia Senate. Um, then, then that became kind of a, a, an issue that was brought to the forefront. Um, the overwhelming response, and my district is, is not uh, heavy with an immigrant population or with a South Asian population. It is almost 75% um, Caucasian and the remaining is African American with a very small um, immigrant or Hispanic population there. So, uh, I was running on the values and the issues that really impact our communities. I was talking about education, I was talking about uh, healthcare and access to uh, transportation. So those are the concerns that uh, really resonated, I think, with the folks in the community. And of course there was bigotry, there was uh, Islamophobic rhetoric, but that's largely in the domain of social media and um, I, I am very adept at ignoring social media, so I really didn't pay any attention to, to, to that kind of uh, language. And so much of it came from outside the district and outside of Virginia. Um, so the folks that uh, I knew and the communities and the relationships I had built, uh, those folks knew me and, and they were very excited about the campaign. I had uh, friends and neighbors who had always voted Republican, but because they knew me personally, they were happy to, to support me in this particular race. So, I mean, uh, we, that's actually really wonderful to hear. Um, how, would, you, uh, would you recommend running for office? Uh, I think there are two other minorities and, and in particular American Muslims who perhaps uh, do feel a little concerned about the posit possible uh, pushback they might get in terms of their faith or feeling targeted. Is there something that you could say to them, do you think, that would uh, encourage them to take that leap? I think if there, anybody has a desire to run for office and has uh, a, the a support of family, that's the most important thing. Your family has to be behind you as a support of family and friends, that they should really do that. Um, you know, every group, every minority group has faced some level of targeting. It is part of the political climate and it has always been part of the political climate. You know, when John Kennedy was running, he was the first Catholic to be running on the national stage and he was targeted for his Catholicism. Uh, we see now we elected Joe Biden, uh, a Catholic, and there was not even a murmur of conversation around his Catholicism. So whether one is Jewish or African-American, Muslim uh, or Hindu, uh, those issues will invariably come up, but at the end of the day, what people really care about is how you are going to represent them, their families, how you're going to address the issues that they care about and, and what impacts their lives. And, and I think being conscious of that and, and speaking to those concerns is what's really important. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, just as a last question, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned the media um, and, um, and also outside media. And for me, that kind of resonates with, you know, the idea that it is a sort of unregulated national sort of media and, and social media that is sort of causing a lot of the issues and, and a lot of the uh, polarized political discourse. Obviously, politicians and public figures are, are engaged in that as well. How important in this context do you think it is that we have a platform that is um, 
generated by uh, minorities, and in this case, American Muslims. Um, how important do you think that it, it is to have that kind of platform that, that tries to redress the balance, uh, project an image that just isn't getting out there, that the American Muslims like you and like so many others, especially in this recent election, are contributing, or whether it's you as public officials or whether it's uh, health professionals on the front line or educators, you know, American Muslims are very integrated into society. So I just wondered if you thought the idea of a Muslim media platform was something that could be advantageous to to bridging the divide. Absolutely. I think it's so essential to have the, the representation through media platforms and through uh, excellent journalists such as yourself who are going to highlight those stories that uh, uh, otherwise would remain invisible. Um, as you well know, uh, a lot of times when mainstream media highlights stories of minority communities, it's through a particular lens. And for Muslims, sadly, it's been through the lens of uh, political violence and uh, through uh, uh, issues that are internationally related. But American Muslims as a community have largely remained invisible and uh, the fact that we are so integrated throughout the fabric of this country and have been for, <laughs> for well over a century, uh, those stories need to be shared and, and um, told. Uh, again, it was um, a strong reason for me to run is that the folks that I worked with uh, did not even realize I was Muslim. Many of them didn't know that I was Muslim. One never talks about their faith, right, at, at work usually. And, and so um, by becoming visible, then uh, people around us are able to say, oh, I do know a Muslim and, and I do know this family and, and I've worked with them and I, uh, I know their heart and I know what they uh, are, are contributing to this country. So our media in particular has a very significant role and it's to share those stories, to push back against the, the dominant narrative and to really underscore and highlight the, the many, many contributions that uh, Muslim Americans have made in, in every profession um, in, in this country. So it's very, very important. Now let's hear from Farah Khan, who is also standing for re-election. Re she is the mayor of Irvine in California. She's the first Muslim woman to lead a large city in the United States and is also the first person of color to hold this position in the city's history. She discusses her predecessor and the mistakes she learned from and how she felt she was the right person to lead her city. When I first started was basically from community services. So I was very engaged in the community um, working on different issues. But at the same time, um, I found myself showing up at council meetings, speaking up during public comments, you know, talking to our uh, representatives who seemed to be just neglecting the community's needs. So it was so important for me, um, especially when people reached out and said, hey, why don't you try running for that office since you're there all the time? And um, when I did decide um, that I would try and venture into um, running for office, it wasn't an easy journey. Um, you know, even folks from my side of the party were basically saying that, you know, maybe our city wasn't ready for so much diversity, um, you know, and uh, maybe someone with a name like mine was unelectable. And so those were things that really um, were meant to kind of dissuade me from running. But at the same time, from my background, that was really the propeller that got me to run and run even harder. And so um, I didn't win, win my first election. I ran in 2016 for the first time and I didn't win that election, but I did build name recognition. So, you know, out of 11 candidates that were running in 2016, I think I came in around four. And then I ran again in 2018. And that's really when I took those negative comments. Um, and, you know, people were always associating me with uh, terrorist organizations and, um, you know, making, making it seem like I had links with people that I shouldn't have links with um, just because my donors were, you know, part of CARE or were part of any other Islamic organization that is um, established in the U.S. And so for me, it was just owning that as much as possible and saying, this is who I really am. And um, for those that want to turn it into something bad, 
uh, you know, they just don't understand me. And so in 2018, I actually came in first out of 12 candidates that were running. And um, really, I wasn't planning on running for mayor because I had a four year term. But this year, we had a mayor that really just took the wrong side when it came to so many social justice issues and, and so much to do with like the BLM um, issue. And, you know, for her to, as a leader of this great city, to basically say that, you know, if you didn't like the way she ran her city, that you could find another city to live in. Um, and then basically telling um, everyone uh, that showed up at the BLM protest, I was there too, that we were out there to incite violence when all of our protests in our city um, have been without any incident, without any violence, very peaceful. I mean, because there were people out there with their kids. There were students out there that were trying to raise the issue of, you know, uh, of injustice. And mm -hmm. so for me, you know, when you look at leadership, you want someone that understands their community and it just wasn't there. And so for me, it was very offensive to hear those remarks, um, especially like when students at UCI were um, showing up in protest, um, asking for relief during the pandemic, she was telling them to go find a job at Amazon. And, you know, these are just not the type of things you want to hear from your leader. And um, at that time, since no one else was challenging her, uh, she was a 28 year incumbent. Um, and so um, for me, it was like, all right, you know what, someone's got to do it. And um, it was it wasn't an easy race because, again, I, I was targeted for my race, for my religion, uh, for everything else. And um, at the end of the day, you know, the the people knew the work that I'd accomplished in my two years uh, compared to her 28 years. And they knew that they wanted change, that there was changing demographics in our city. So, um, you know, beating her uh, with a 13,000 vote lead was quite, quite amazing. Why is it important that Muslims, American Muslims, and obviously all minorities, but, but in particular American Muslims, why is it important that we run for, um, you know, first of all, get politically engaged and run for elected office. I, I believe we've had a record number elected uh, across the country at state and local level. Um, in your view, why is it so important? You know, there's a saying, um, if you're not um, at the table, you're on the menu. And I think for Muslims, we've been on that menu far too long. Um, and so it's time for us to be the policy makers. It's time for us to have that seat at the table where decisions are being made, um, not only about us, but about so many other people that don't have that voice. And so, you know, um, when it comes to immigration, when it comes to um, so much that happens in our daily lives, uh, we just need to have that voice that understands. And if we don't have that, then we see, you know, ourselves declining as a nation, as a city. We see um, people making judgments on our behalf and that needs to end. Agreed, agreed. Um, I, I wanted to get your opinion on the uh, current political uh, stalemate that we're in, uh, in the sense that we have a president who has refused to accept um, the transition process, or, or maybe he's reluctantly coming to, to accept it, but still hasn't initiated the transition process. I just wonder, as someone who's been involved in community work, is now working at state level, um, you know, what, what's your view of this, the, the, the political uh, state of the country uh, and this, this situation in particular? You know, um, we, we all know Trump uh, after these four years. We know exactly what he's up to. And um, this is just another show. So um, eventually he's going to have to leave. And I think, um, you know, the fact that his party members are, are, you know, allowing him to behave this way is unacceptable. I think there needs to be a bigger push from his side to basically accept the fact that he has lost and now he needs to work on transitioning in the new president. And so, you know, eventually it's gonna happen, but it's unfortunate that it's taking this route. Um, and I also wanted to ask you, considering the election result, considering that there were uh, almost 70 million or so uh, Americans who voted for Donald Trump and I guess to some extent his ideology, um, I wanted to. I wondered from your experience as an interfaith um, sort of pro um, proponent who's worked hard in your community to bring people together. Um, 
does it make you feel uh, d- does it make you feel dis- despaired about the fact that there were so many people who bought into his ideology um do you think there's work to be done or do you think something else was at play you know it, it's 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 kind of scary because you have to really wonder whether those people were voting because of what he says or what he does um a lot of it has to do with the economics right um so you have people that are going to be voting for him just based on economics um but then there's going to be a portion of those people that are voting for him because of the rhetoric that he's brought forward because of the way that he has um basically um criminalized so many communities and so that's really where the concern comes in is what percentage of those folks are um are voting for him based on that and and that's going to be hard to find out um you know because there's going to be a wide spectrum of people that voted for him for different reasons right absolutely um so so one of the questions uh, the, 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 it's probably the last thing i wanted to ask you was that you know partly because of uh what happened in the last four years um that's one of the reasons why american muslim today was 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 created um i think there was a lot of helplessness a feeling of helplessness by a lot of muslims feeling like you know obviously there were other targeted communities as well but feeling as if we we are sort of helpless being targeted and have no um no recourse um obviously one way of of uh, sort of uh, push back is to i think get electorally involved get politically engaged and i think uh, another route or in particular that we took at american muslim today was to become part of the media to 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 sort of take control of our narrative and see how uh, and uh, and decide for ourselves how muslims are going to be represented rather than relying on others or uh, having no op- opportunity to respond to the way that we're projected in the media generally or by politicians so i wonder in that context um how important do you think it is that we do have uh, our own sort of media and our own forms of representation uh when it comes to you know how muslims are represented oh absolutely is very important um like i said before you know if you're not at the um helm of um basically putting forward your own narrative then someone else is going to do it and that's really what's been happening in the past is we've had other media outlets basically define who we are and so it it is very critical that we not only have um media but we have media throughout the nation i mean like right here you know we have a very right wing um media source that is not even accepting the fact that i'm the first muslim to be elected mayor for a major city in all of california i'm the first woman of color to be elected mayor to the city council. And so, you know, when when they're not even able to highlight those things, but they want to highlight some person that came in uh third place uh and on city council who happens to be a white male. I mean, come on. Who's making change right now? It's not him. And so we need people like you and on other um outlets to really be in there um highlighting and supporting uh, Muslims that are achieving um you know making sure that our voices are being heard that we're the ones setting the tone for our narrative well thank you for joining us today from me and my team hadia spalic and maya gela be sure to follow us on instagram twitter and tiktok at american muslim today if you'd like to access more digital content please feel free to check out our website americanmuslimtoday.com we'll see you next week on the muslim viewpoint <laughs>